his uh, PhD degree in physics and also the PhD degree in medicine in uh, Göttingen in Germany. <clears throat> and he was uh, a time uh, assistant professor and subsequent to his habilitation and uh, after that as an associate professor at the third institute of physics in Göttingen. And uh, since 1993 he has been a full professor in experimental and applied physics at the University of Oldenburg. Um, Mr. Kohlmeier is head of the medical physics group, scientific director of the Hörzentrum Oldenburg and since 2000, he has been speaker of the National Center of Excellence in Biomedical Engineering with the name Hearing Aid System Technology or Hörtech in German. And since 2008, he's head of the Fraunhofer Project Group Hearing, Speech and Audio Technology and is chairman of the Center of Excellence Hearing for All. And uh, Dr. Kohlmeier was uh, awarded several fellowships and scientific prizes and uh, the newest one, I think so, and uh, it's a really great uh, award, is uh, he's the, he's, he's, uh, no, he, he get the German uh, President's Award for Technology and Innovation in 2012. It's called in German der Deutsche Zukunftspreis. And uh, it's, a, it's a really uh, fascinating and great uh, award. And he's past president also from the German Audiological Society and Secretary General of the European Federation of Audiological Societies. So he's a really uh, man with uh, many competences. And so I'm very proud and uh, I'm very glad to have you here and uh, that you can now hear him to your speech, your lecture with the title Cocktail Parties and Binaural Hearing Aids, How Hearing Technology Gets Us Contacted. And I think it should, it was a little bit uh, interactive today at the moment. I hope, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope that I can wake up my computer here. <laughs> oh, there seems to be some problem going on at the moment. Um, so, um, the, okay, now it's waking up. Um, the connection to consumer electronics is not very hard uh, of in my side. I uh, am, a, as Peter Friedrich already told you, a medical doctor and um, a physicist, but um, I have not yet had much connection to um, uh, consumer electronics. And the first uh, thing that uh, really uh, came into consumer electronics, the first connection, was then um, to be uh, part of the um, Institute for Digital Media Technology, um, of Institute, uh, connected or uh, led by Karl-Heinz Brandenburg, and um, in a way people say that we have now a very good uh, business model because um, with the MP3 players and all the appliances that they developed in, uh, in Ilmenau, um, there you make people deaf and with our hearing aids you compensate for it in one way or the other. Well, this is not quite, um, quite true. Of course, um, there we have other things to do and not only um, the, um, uh, the, the uh, MP3 players make people deaf, it's rather another problem, namely um, it's more a problem of aging. Hearing impairment is the most common sensory disease that is around in um, our population. Uh, it uh, uh, stretches out to about 80% of our population and with increasing age the risk of uh, getting a hearing loss increases. So if you're born, you only have a risk of about 0.3%, but if you're at the age of 65, then 50% of all your um, age group has um, hearing loss, which uh, needs some treatment. And for that, it's very important that um, uh, we uh, do something against that. And uh, this is also uh, the main issue that we're dealing with in our cluster of excellence here for all which was established uh, last year within the German Excellence Initiative. 
And uh, the name is already the program, and we want to bring hearing not only to the uh, hearing impaired listeners and to the deaf people, it's called the implants, but also to the users, for example, of consumer electronics, um, where some hearing technology can already um, assist them in listening to uh, speech and to music in a way that is most suited for hearing impaired listeners, so that if you have a mild hearing loss, a beginning hearing loss, you start getting um, accustomed to hearing support not only uh, uh, if you are already that much hearing impaired that you really need a hearing aid, but already um, at an early stage. So in order to um, give you a little uh, demonstration what is the, the uh, main problem that hearing impaired listeners have, um, I would like to play you a sentence in noise. And this uh, is a very common, uh, common complaint for hearing impaired listeners, namely that they cannot understand speech and noise. So try to uh, understand the sentence in noise as fast as possible. As fast as possible, but the computer seems, seems to be a bit slow. <laughs> Rachel has seven pretty spoons. I hope that you have understood it already the first time, but um, if you have understood it the first time, then you have um, a very um, sharp uh, ear. Um, if you have uh, understood it the second time, then you have, um, uh, it was played here, then it's uh, uh, the condition where hearing impaired listeners in a um, in a room have problems, but normal listeners uh, should be able to understand it quite well. So this is um, uh, marginally if you did not understand, but if you have not understood it the third time, so the third time is uh, was played as a, a more favorable signal to noise ratio, then you probably should consult me afterwards because you may have some, some kind of hearing problem. Well, what you have heard here is a test, a sentence test, uh, which does not uh, have any semantic um, information. And we have the same test available also in other languages, uh, for example. Nushen üç temiz çatal çizdi. Or I very much like the difference between the uh, English, the British version. Hannah likes two thin shoes. And uh, the American version. Thomas sees eight pretty chairs. So um, listening in uh, noise is uh, one of the main problems that hearing impaired listeners have. The other problems uh, that they have are their distortions. Um, namely, our ear acts as a nonlinear distortive system. And um, normally, you as um, people who are involved with uh, hi-fi or super hi-fi audio would not think that uh, our uh, ear is as bad as um, uh, uh, amplifier hi-fi. Who does not comply with a hi-fi norm who has a distortion factor of more than 1%? But that's something that I would like to demonstrate to you. I would like to play you one tone, which, is, um, which comes from one speaker, which has a frequency of 1 um, kilohertz, 1.2 kilohertz, like this. And now, oh, excuse me, two, two kilohertz, it was a bit higher. So, and now if we play a second tone, um, which goes up in frequency, and it sounds like this, it comes from the second speaker. So if we, if we now play both together, they are added up in the air, and you know that the air is pretty linear, and you should only perceive two sounds, two tones. However, if you listen carefully, you will be able to detect a third tone which goes down in frequency. If you don't hear the third tone immediately, you should perhaps uh, go a bit back and forth or left and right with your head because you may incidentally be in a, in a minimum um, uh, of the sound field uh, with a standing wave and so you might move your head a little bit. So try to listen to the third tone. Who have heard the third tone? Okay, should I play it again? <laughs> this is the one that goes down. 
Has now everybody heard the third tone? Yes. Every, who has heard the third tone now? Okay, that's that's good because that means that you're all normal listeners. <laughs> um, because what you have heard is the distortion component, which only um, occurs in our ears um, as a consequence of the nonlinear compression that takes place in our ear, and uh, that is uh, normally not detected in, in everyday life because uh, our ear is not made for listening to tones in isolation, but rather to listen to complex broadband sounds. And there, these distortion components don't show up. Uh, in a way, the ear is very similar to the eye, which is also a very faulty nonlinear transmission system. And Hermann von Helmholtz, one of the pioneer in sensory physics, he first, first was a physician and invented the eye mirror and uh, did the first theory of um, hearing. Uh, and then became uh, the physicist and the German Reichskanzler of the German of physics, the uh, father of the Physikalische uh, Technische uh, Bundesanstalt. And he said that if an optician would uh, be as bad as giving such a poor optical instrument as a human eye, he would immediately dismiss this guy. Um, so in a way, uh, our senses are nonlinear in nature, but our brain is able to compensate that and to create very clear pictures and very crystal clear audio impressions, even though our receivers are so poor. Um, now, if you have a hearing loss or hearing impairment, uh, then the nonlinearities of uh, the ear go away, the, the compression dies out, and um, you are left with the expansion, the internal expansion, which is there still in the brain. And this is the reason for the so-called recruitment phenomenon. That is, for people with a hearing loss, they have the problem that if, the, um, if you speak to them, they say, oh, please, uh, I don't hear you. Can you speak up, please? And then if you increase your voice, then they say, oh, don't shout at me. I'm not deaf. Uh, this is the so-called recruitment phenomenon or the um, problem that their dynamic range is increased, that after too soft, already too loud occurs. I would like to play you an acoustical demonstration of that. I will first uh, play you um, some um, example uh, music and speech uh, as a normal listener would uh, perceive it, and you will hear that the music <coughs> increases in level. Now, a um, hearing impaired listener with recruitment would have um, the problem that um, uh, he would that um, uh, a hearing impaired listener with recruitment for him it would sound like this. So probably you have noticed that you couldn't hear anything or not too much at the beginning and at the end it was, there was a big increase in loudness and it was also a bit distorted, uh, especially the high frequencies went away, that's typical for um, hearing impairment um, with increasing age and uh, there's this distortion component. With a hearing aid, um, you are only able to compensate parts of this distortion component. In a way, the um, uh, task of a hearing aid would be to compensate for the distortive nonlinear processing that uh, occurs due to uh, hearing loss. If you would um, make the comparison to uh, an optical system, then hearing loss is something like looking through um, milky glass and only seeing a very uh, small part of the whole scenery and adding just amplification is something like adding more light which makes everything brighter but you don't see more you only see um, the uh, scene um, lighter but you don't see the contrast anymore this is the pro problem that hearing aids can only um, give you the general impression um, but cannot restore the original sound. So um, the same listener with a hearing aid would perhaps um, um, hear the music like this. Mm -hmm. 
So if you listen carefully to it, you can still hear some of the distortions, which are very typical uh, for the hearing loss. But um, the overall sound impression has been restored due to the proper amplification in the different frequency bands. Now, um, we have already seen that there is more to hearing loss than just an attenuation. There's also the distortion component and this uh, loss in um, speech understanding and noise environments. And this is uh, the reason why in our cluster of excellence we are concentrating on looking for the causes for hearing loss and how can we cure that or help uh, the patients by providing appropriate uh, technology. And there it comes also very close to the subject of this conference. So uh, the typical problem is that we have an auditory scene uh, like this and um, <coughs> Then, uh, uh, in this auditory scene, we first have to make sure that the sound presentation is okay. We have to um, amplify and uh, present the sound to the appropriate part of the auditory pathway. And we have to compensate for the sensory transmission loss. That is not only the increasing of the uh, level, but also try to overcome the information um, problem. Uh, the low pass of the information between the ear and the brain, which is due to hearing loss. And this is more or less the classical view of hearing aids, especially the sound uh, presentation. Then, um, in addition to that, there's not only the ear, but there's also the brain, and uh, most of the listening is performed with our brain, and uh, we have to fit the hearing aids to the individual listener, and not vice versa. So the individualization is a matter of uh, importance. And last but not least, if you have a complex acoustical scene, um, you want to find out how the listener selects the source that he or she wants to attend to. And you have to tell your device how that uh, should be done and which listener to attend to. And this is a tricky problem that we're trying to tackle, for example, the brain-computer interfaces, to tell the device uh, which of the different objects is the one uh, that is desired. So these are the main problems that uh, have to be tackled in the hearing aid and cochlear implant domain. Um, and as physicists, um, you normally tackle such a problem by first going into theory. And the way uh, we do that is by setting up models, auditory models, that uh, try to um, con condensate as much of our knowledge about the auditory system and the function of the auditory system into a computer model, and uh, such a um, model may look like this. You have two inputs to the both ears, some um, frequency filter, some dynamic compression, and some modulation filtering, some binaural interaction, and then a, a detector, um, an optimum detector, or some um, pattern recognizer, which uh, tells the brain or helps the brain to distinguish between desired objects and undesired objects. And from that, you can predict the results. And um, the whole idea is that um, such a model can only be validated if you have appropriate experiments. For example, if you perform experiments with humans, listening experiments, and uh, try to predict the outcomes of the experiments with the computer model. And on the other way, try to uh, devise uh, critical experiments for the hearing impaired listeners to find out if everything is um, well taken care of in the model um, and uh, by that you prove the model and if you have a more or less good working model you can use that to improve the performance of technical systems also computers or um, consumer electronics in order to optimally um, address the needs of the hearing impaired listener and uh, this will help to increase the system performance and to have a closed um, circuit so in a way it's a little bit like um, Baron von Münchhausen, the Germans perhaps known, he was able to drag himself out of the swamp by his own hair. And, well, for me it's not a bit, it's a bit problematic, but at least for him it was possible, and we tried to do that with some cyclic involvement. So, in the remainder of my talk, I would like to bring you a bit closer the different views that come together in order to devise such an auditory model and to find out how the hearing system 
works and how uh, it can be compensated. And for that, we can have different views. The first one, because I'm also a medical doctor, is of course the medical view, and you all know that we have an outer ear, um, the, the middle ear, uh, and then the um, inner ear. The middle ear is there to transform the um, airborne sound, the airborne acoustic wave into a waterborne sound, which is uh, uh, divided into different frequency bands within the cochlea. So schematically, it, it works like that, that in the inner ear, in the cochlea, uh, the sound is uh, uh, converted from vibration into nerve action. And um, this is then uh, given to the brain with the uh, uh, cochlear nerve. And um, this is more or less the physiological view, but the physicist view is quite different. So as a physicist, you would like to view the ear like this. So you have some, some inputs on the one side, and you have some operations like a filter bank to separate the sound into different frequencies, and some nonlinear dynamic compression. You have already seen some action of that, uh, namely the distortion. Uh, uh, the, the, distortion component that you can hear is some um, correlate of that. And then you have some binary noise reduction. The right and the left ear are combined to extract the binary noise information. And you have also some temporal analysis in the modulation filter. Like of course, you have some internal noise. And then um, you get something like the internal representation. And the internal representation is the internal image of the outer acoustical world which is used by your brain to find out what are the different objects that are around you. And on this internal image, most of the processing, the cognitive processing is done. And most of the impairment is done on the way, on the transformation from the acoustical signal to this internal representation. So it's very important to have a good knowledge of how this nonlinear transformation takes place. And you can also characterize hearing impairment by looking at the different places where such impairments can happen. And uh, there are four different factors, uh, which I will highlight in the following a bit more. Uh, you start with some peripheral factors, like um, hearing loss at the uh, outer, and middle, and inner ear level, then uh, loss of the compression, but also some loss of the, the internal noise. If the internal noise gets increased, and you have a loss of resolution. This refers to the information transmission loss that takes place. And last but not least, um, uh, reduction of the binary noise reduction uh, or um, decrease of your performance in binary hearing. Um, these different levels or these different processing steps can be attributed to different levels of processing and uh, differentiate between the acoustical level, which is more the um, processing at the outer um, middle ear and some input to the inner ear, and the sensory processing, which takes place on the way from the inner ear to the internal representation, and more cognitive processing, which is on the top level, so to say, from this internal representation to some meaning. Now let's start with the acoustical level and uh, the first parts of the sensory processing. And as I already pointed out, Helmholtz is a pioneer in that and in our garden of hearing in, in Oldenburg. If you ever have a chance to come to the northwest of the Republic, please have a look in our auditory garden with lots of hands-on experiments um, to play around with acoustics. And one demonstration are the Helmholtz resonators. He has devised them to um, um, analyze sound uh, in a very nice fashion and um, to develop his first theory of how the inner ear works. Today we know that it's not quite the, um, the accurate theory, but nevertheless it's, it's a good approximation. And a better approximation can also be seen at the House of Hearing, namely a model of the inner ear, which works like this. Uh, you have on the one hand, on the left side, you have the um, um, on the left side um, you have the input of the sound, so there's a, um, um, some vibrator, some shaker, which acts a bit like the starpist, like the middle ear, and then you have a fluid, um, and the fluid is filled, uh, filled some little kennels that are um, vertically, 
and in these scanners some fluid um, uh, vibrates up and down and on top of the fluid there is some um, air, some air cushion and with increasing distance from the starpers the mass of the fluid gets higher and the um, stiffness of the cushion, of the air cushion, gets uh, uh, lower. So you have a system which is more resonating at lower frequencies. And this is exactly what is happening at the ears. At the end, you have a higher mass and low stiffness, or so low resonance frequency at the, at the beginning. You have a high stiffness and a small mass. And so this means that you have a high resonance frequency. Um, we can also, um, this is used to separate the high frequencies that are displayed at the beginning of the cochlea and the um, low frequencies that are more at the end. And I could uh, demonstrate you this in a movie. Uh, starting with very high frequencies, uh, you get some excitation on the left side and then the, uh, it um, moves more to the right side and uh, at the low frequencies you are here at the end. And uh, this um, is a very easy demonstration of how the inner ear works. Um, of course, it's only a linear approximation. It's only a linear model of um, the frequency separation. A more exact um, model also takes into account some of the masking effects and some of the nonlinear effects. And one way to do that is a model where you look for the instantaneous frequency within each frequency band, and you look if the uh, component that is just uh, analyzed in your band um, is part of your core exactly displayed here on the uh, on the right side. Um, this is the uh, frequency excitation. You want to uh, get more or less the core excitation and uh, not some components that uh, come from the side, some side excitation. And um, you should only amplify and consider the <coughs> components that are due to the core excitation and that can be distinguished between both uh, if you look for the instantaneous frequency. So if the instantaneous frequency fits uh, with the center frequency of the band, then you can amplify and compress the respective component, whereas if the instantaneous frequency does not fit, then you uh, simply um, don't consider it and don't amplify it. So this refers to some um, model scheme, some compression scheme, which is uh, plotted here. I don't want to go too much into detail, but I just want to acoustically demonstrate to you the acoustical consequences of that. If you take a normal uh, sentence um, w without any processing, it may sound like this. Überquere die Straße vorsichtig. Um, and if you uh, take the normal, uh, the, the standard um, dynamic compression, multiband dynamic compression, which is thought to be the best way of compensating for the recruitment phenomenon, then something like this happens. <coughs> so you get an amplification of all frequency components and you smear out all the dynamic uh, contrasts. And this is just the opposite of what a hearing aid should do. It should increase, uh, but it should not decrease the, uh, the contrast. And so one way of solving this problem is to um, take the uh, uh, look at the instantaneous frequency and with this model you get some um, uh, dynamic compression which looks like this. Überquere die Straße vorsichtig. Which uh, still sounds a bit crazy for us normal listeners, but for the hearing impaired listeners it has big advantages because it does some dynamic compression without reducing the contrast. Okay, so uh, fast compression looks promising, but we have also to look for other things, especially for the binaural hearing, that is the comparison between the left and the right ear. And this is uh, uh, one major um, point of work that we are involved with in, in Oldenburg, and this is also very important for the so-called cocktail party effect. Namely, in a cocktail party, uh, normal listeners are able to separate the sounds from different speakers and they can do that quite well because uh, they have two ears and a more or less functioning cocktail party processor in between which can compare the uh, sound from the right and from the left ear and by that find out where the sound comes from. So this difference between both ears is used and is processed. This difference of course cannot be assessed if you have just a uh, hearing aid on the left side 
and uh, can not be assessed by the technical system if you have to the left a hearing aid and to the right a hearing aid because the spinal processing, this comparison between left and right, decays as one of the first things if you have a hearing loss. So the ultimate uh, way in order to treat a hearing impairment and to um, supply hearing impaired listeners with some uh, basic um, uh, abilities to do some binary processing is to use binaural hearing aids, a coupled hearing aid from the left and the right ear, and use the difference between both ears in order to process the sound in such a way that um, the acoustical contrast, also the spatial contrast, are enhanced. Um, the way to do that comes again from physics, from theory. So uh, Lord Rayleigh was one of the pioneers in uh, finding out how localization and how binaural hearing works. And um, he also devised um, the duplex theory, namely that you can um, at low frequency localize because of the interaural uh, time differences and at high frequencies with the interaural phase differences. I have a little device here, uh, which I will ask uh, our chair to use out during the remainder of the lecture. It's a <laughs> It's a, it's a directional decoupler, so the input to the right ear goes to the left ear, and from the left ear it goes to the right ear. Well, you should close your ears, your eyes, and look at me and say where the sound comes from. Okay. Okay. So, she is not, she is not, well, that's quite good, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so obviously, our chair is, is a very good low frequency listener. Thank you. Um, this um, confuser only um, takes the high frequencies from the right to the left and uh, from the left to the right. And if you are very good at low frequency listening, um, and if you're good at localizing the low frequencies, then you're not confused, and that's her ability. So our chair is very good at uh, localizing at low frequencies. Uh, and uh, Lord Rayleigh had already pointed that out. Uh, you can also demonstrate how hearing, uh, the spinal hearing localization works um, with a little uh, experiment that we have in the Garden of Hearing. Uh, um, the so-called binaural lake. It's an unequal lake for waves, for surface waves. You produce some sound or some waves with a um, bowl, a bowl that is going up and down. And then in the middle of the lake, you have the physicist's uh, model of a human head. So physicists are a little bit simple-minded. You may think you have the nose here. This is the nose, and then two eyes, and you have two ear canals. And on both sides, in the ear canals. Uh, the model for the uh, uh, membrane, for the tympanic membrane, that are just two wine corks that go up and down if some wave comes in. And the model of the brain that tries to compare left and right ear is just a simple stick to connect the right and the left uh, ear. Uh, and whenever some sound comes from the front, then both ears um, vibrate uh, in phase, and uh, the stick goes up and down at this little index at the top goes front and back and shows to the direction of the uh, sound source. Whereas if um, the sound source comes from the right, then uh, both are a little bit out of the face and uh, the stick will rotate a little bit and the index will show towards the other direction. If you don't believe me, you can look at this video. Now the uh, stick uh, now the, uh, comes from the left. And you can see here the little uh, index moves to the direction of that uh, bowl, and now it comes from the right, and you can see that this little index moves to the right. And this is a very simple experiment of how binaural hearing works. Of course, binaural hearing in our brain is not so simple as a stick. There are more other things uh, attached to it. For example, the so-called uh, precedence effect, or the law of the first wavefront, namely that the first part of the sound is most important for localization. That's something which I would like to demonstrate to you. I have two speakers here, here, and there. 
And I will now play you a sound from uh, the speaker. And you should say from which speaker you hear the sound. This one? Yeah. Okay. And plug it. <laughs> and the sound is still there. So what is happening? Well, if I if I plug this one, it's gone. So do it again. So you have you heard the sound always from this one, even though it actually came out of the other speaker. That's because on that speaker we only played the transient, the beginning, and on the other speaker we played in slow onset. So the speaker went from the uh, right speaker from your direction to the left speaker. But if I unplug the right speaker you hear no effect, but you still localize it, the sound to the right speaker. This is just because your binary system gets fooled a little bit. And um, this is um, the reason why you always have to look for the onset in, in binary scenes. And um, you can do that uh, using a binary processing scheme for hearing aids. And this is just a schematic view of how that is done. It can be put into a prototype hearing aids that, as we did in our work, and um, now it's um, already available in commercial binary hearing aids. We have a link between both uh, the left and the right side and help people to um, communicate better in noisy situations. Now the technology behind that is some kind of uh, filtering um, comparison between left and right. I don't want to go too much into details. I also will only play you some demos if you um, encourage me to do that later. Or rather, I would like to come um, to the next level. So we have talked a little bit about the acoustics and the sensory processing. Now let's come to the uh, cognitive processing level. Because the binaural noise reduction is more on the sensory side and the cognitive <coughs> processing is very important. Of course, sensory uh, processing um, is impaired, but the um, cognitive processing helps you to overcome some of the deficits that you have in the sensory world and um, you are very well able to supply some missing parts of your uh, external auditory scene by just your expectation and your world knowledge and your cognitive processing. I would like to demonstrate you with that. Uh, I will first play you a um, sample of sound where you can hear some uh, breaks in between, so it will sound like this. Sounds terrible. Hmm? That's uh, like if you take out some chunks of the music uh, and you just uh, insert zeros, it does not sound very well. However, what happens if you insert in these breaks simple noise? Normally, you would say, well, you don't add any information, but um, I will play you uh, the scenery with noise in between, and you will hear, of course, you will hear the noise, but if you listen carefully, you will hear that the music is continuous, that you have a continuous impression of the noise, and the um, uh, music um, involves, and you sti still hear the, um, the um, change due to the noise. So. Uh, let's check if you can hear the music continuously. So who has heard the music continuously? Yeah? Okay, very good. You have a Robbie Williams simulator in your head uh, that uh, fills out any of the breaks that are in between. And this is just cognitive processing because you know what is expected. And the most uh, natural interpretation of the scene that you have some Robbie Williams and then a noise and then again Robbie Williams. The most natural interpretation is that, well, there's some noise, but Robbie Williams carries on. And this is what your brain then displays. You can use some of the cognitive processing um, um, abilities, uh, this process of glimpsing that takes place in the, our brain, to um, do some objective uh, estimation of 
auditory scenes and uh, checking what is going on in the world without you. So this is uh, just an example of a tracking system where you have three concurrently uh, active speakers in the room that are tracked with two microphones and uh, you try to find out uh, which speaker is at which point of time uh, um, active. And this can be done quite well using some of this auditory glimpsing idea. Now, my uh, chairman has told me I can talk about everything, but not about more than three quarters of an hour. So let me come to uh, some conclusion. So uh, I hope to have given you a little bit of an uh, example that uh, this auditory model-based hearing aid processing that we've talked about is required to increase uh, or the, the benefits that hearing repair listeners have is a significant part of our population. Uh, we need to compensate for the uh, compressive nonlinearity loss. Uh, we can do that by multiband dynamic compression, which is coupled in an intelligent way, not just uh, spectrally independent, but rather using some models to um, preserve all the contrast. The binaural hearing loss, the specific deficits of hearing for listeners not being able to process the differences between both ears um, can be tackled with binary interactive <coughs> hearing aids that support this binary uh, hearing and actually the uh, German president's um, uh, award for science and te technology was uh, devoted towards this development. And last but not least, the cognitive processing um, is important to um, process glimpsing and the important aspects of the sound in such a way as also our brain does. And only if you do it in a correct way, we are able to tackle with our complex systems, with our uh, consumer electronic and hearing aid devices, the complex um, auditory world with only two microphones, only two inputs from the left and the right. So I hope to have convinced you that such a multi um, faceted problem needs a multidisciplinary approach and uh, we are lucky that in our cluster of excellence uh, hearing for all um, we have uh, physicists, engineers, medical doctors, biologists, physiologists, linguists and all uh, other disciplines surrounding us to work together for this common goal to provide some hearing for all for people in all places and at all times. So thank you very much for your patience and this is a little view from our house of here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for this very exciting and uh, interesting uh, talk and lecture. And uh, please, do you have questions to Mr. Kohlmeier? Uh, we have some microphones in this room, perhaps. Hi there. Um, I was very interested uh, in, in the model you're showing. The one part you didn't get too much into was the actual conversion uh, into nerve nerve impulses. And are there any characteristics about that that, uh, that, are, that are interesting? Yeah, well, um, of course, there are lots of models available for a single auditory nerve and for transferring from the synapse to the auditory nerve. And uh, this acts a bit like a, um, a low-pass filter and some depletion. Um, but on the other hand, you have not only a single synapse and a single auditory nerve, but a whole ensemble. And for that, um, uh, one approach is to, to do lots of models of different population of auditory um, cells or nerve cells and or synapses, uh, which may get very complicated without um, really showing the effective uh, properties. On the other hand, you can look uh, what is the information um, that is uh, transmitted from the whole ensemble, from, from the whole population of auditory nerve fibers. And for that, uh, one of the best uh, approximations is that you have uh, some kind of adaptation um, plus some type of low-pass filter for the envelope. And this is then fed in into some later envelope frequency or modulation frequency processing stage. And so our approach is more to go for the effective modeling rather than uh, go on a single uh, nerve uh, side. 
because with the effective uh, processing, we can link it better to the signal processing that really uh, is occurring in audio devices. It seems like the um, human hearing loss starts from single sight. I assume that the brain will compensate with the right hearing. For example, you have left, left uh, hearing loss, the right hearing will compensate. Do you think how much percentage this compensation could be uh, for a uh, normal health person? And also, I was just thinking, uh, second question, uh, nowadays when people are doing uh, headphones, um, both ears give the same kind of uh, binary processing, is that reasonable or should it should be personalized? Yeah, so uh, thank you. The first uh, question was about um, Monitor versus binary hearing loss. Um, well, of course, if you have a noise, noise trauma in one ear, or um, typically the dentists who have one ear closer to the source of the noise, um, then you have a higher hearing loss in one ear than the other. But the normal biological aging process is the same in both ears. So the overwhelming case of uh, hearing impairment is that you have a more or less symmetrical hearing loss. But even if you have an unsymmetrical hearing loss, um, you compensate lots of um, the differences um, by some um, shifting of your internal representation to the middle. This is the same as you can already experience yourself. If you plug only one ear, you will hear everything from the uh, healthy ear. But after some time, uh, the uh, image shifts and you compensate internally, perceptually, for this uh, attenuation. And if you then take out the plug, everything goes to the other side and slowly goes back to the middle. This happens in um, hearing impaired listeners, but of course the face related direct comparison between the right and left breaks down as soon as you have an uh, asymmetric hearing loss. So in that case, asymmetric hearing loss has a special problem. Um, the second case was uh, with stereo uh, presentation and binary presentation. Well. Um, since binaural um, uh, hearing is one of the first abilities that goes down, it would be good to support some of the binary hearing by supplying some extra binary cues like super, added, uh, super directivity or some um, uh, noise suppression that is based on binaural cues. Um, and that's in a way um, simulates the action that normally your brain does for you. Yeah, thank you. Do you have one, another, I think, one question we have uh, for this, we have time? Please, Hans. Yeah, I have another question to the physics. Isn't there a, a kind of puzzling effect that the speed of, uh, of <coughs> processing depends on frequencies, so this can overtake? Um, the, uh, at low frequencies, you take uh, they have a bit longer latency because traveling waves have to uh, travel to the apex, to the end of the uh, 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 cochlea, whereas high frequencies um, are a bit faster. They go to the uh, beginning of the cochlea. And uh, normally you would assume that um, uh, with uh, high frequencies you are then faster and that you should perceive the high frequencies faster than the low frequencies. But this is not the case. There is a central um, compensation for that. Uh, compensation that makes a click sound like a click. Because if you see an, uh, an event where some, something happens uh, acoustically and visually, then we learn that this all belongs together. And somehow we centrally delay the high frequencies and also a little bit the low frequencies so that they are aligned to the visual uh, impression. The visual system is in the order of 20 to 30 milliseconds slower than the uh, auditory system. You have more synapses and it takes longer processing time. And to um, create the, um, uh, the uh, concept of uh, similarity of, of, uh, or of um, being simultaneous, the concept of simultaneously, you have to uh, delay both events to a certain degree, which relates to a distance of about 10 meters. 
because the light is faster traveling than uh, sound, and if you um, have a certain distance, then both are such a line. Of course, if you go closer and if you go far away, then both um, impression can go apart. But our central auditory system and our cognitive system is very good at compensating for any of these processing delays. One can, little, little. Very quick, please. Hello, good morning. My name is Gisinik, and uh, maybe it's outside your uh, scope, but um, some people hear noises that are not there. They are not, it's called tinnitus. Yes. Okay, tinnitus. Uh, do you expect, or maybe you work in this area, do you expect some actual like solutions, or from physics, <laughs> or is it just a Psychology problem or a psychiatric <laughs> or a neural problem or so. That's the point of the term. Maybe I have to. Yeah, it's a, it's a multifaceted problem. Tinnitus is normally uh, something which is compared to the phantom um, pain that you have if you lose a limb, for example. You still have the impression that something is tickling at the limb. And uh, that's the same uh, with, with tinnitus where if you lose a hair cell or if you lose some abilities in your um, peripheral auditory system, and the central auditory system mirrors that and uh, uh, tries to play to the uh, cognition that something is still there. And there are several ways trying to compensate for that, for example, stimulating at a uh, low range or uh, doing some training that tinnitus does not, um, even though you hear it, but still does not uh, depress you. So there are different faceted, uh, facets of that. Um, the pure sensory side, which is uh, you have a, a connection to hearing loss and some, um, some uh, compensation for that, which you can aid to, so, uh, and also the cognitive side, which you can treat by psychological counseling.